Okay. So can I invite Mr. Flood to make the opening statement, please? So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to uh, start by saying uh, thanking the committee for allowing me the opportunity to have a, have a talk today about the proposed bill um, that's been put forward. Um, it was very disturbing to read the proposal as made by Ngrathe Siakona and the Department of Justice. Um, to give a little bit background um, of my experience, in shooting sports I've been honoured to represent Ireland in silhouette target shooting professionally for seven years. Um, I was a carded athlete on the Irish Sports Council's pace carding scheme and gained the rating of a world class two athlete. I trained seven days a week, um, sometimes three times a day. Um, the amount of ammunition that I would expend down range per year would have been about 25,000 rounds per year, so it was quite a significant amount. Um, I was lucky in so much as um, during my career I won the national championships seven times, the Irish national championships. I won eight European championship titles and gold medals. I won a bronze medal in the 2004 world championship and I placed in the top three in the US championships. In my final year, which is the year that I retired um, after an injury, a couple of injuries that I had had, um, I won the US championship uh, title, uh, beating the reigning world champion. Um, also that year I won the German Open Championship um, and I would again won the Irish National Championships. So I decided that it was a really good year to stop and continue on with something else. So um, anyway, after reading the, the report or the proposed bill, it really was um, insulting um, to say the least because of the contents. And that basically is a vein that's followed quite uh, probably for the last number of years, in relation to the attachment of crime and criminality to sporting firearms and people who are involved in shooting sports. Um, it's the furthest thing from the truth um, in relation to um, my experience of meeting both people here and, and abroad. Yeah. So, um, I was, as I say, I was disturbed. I feel that the working group who proposed such changes might have benefited greatly by the inclusion of interested parties as a whole in forming their suggested proposals. We should take the opportunity to look at the proposal, not in its form as put forward, but with changes that take into account the reality of what might be needed and into the future. And I'd like to thank you for taking the time to listen. Thank you very much indeed. Just to point out as well that the format that we have here on the Oireachtas in the main is we have this pre-legislative scrutiny where before bills are properly published, um, the, the heads of bills have to come to committees such as this for scrutiny and for uh, examination and where members of the public and NGOs and experts can actually give their points of view and engage. And we've done that here with uh, 11 bills, I think, so far, uh, of all the bills that have come through in the last while. So it's, it's very productive and very useful. And we have found that very often um, proposals that have emanated from the department have been changed significantly because of this process. So just to to say, you know, this is what the, the process we're in. No decisions have been made at all yet and won't be until we're finished with our deliberations. Terrific. Thank, thank you for that, sir. Mr. Belinsky. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks very much for having me here. Uh, thank you, committee members. I'm delighted to speak. Um, I wrote a document called The Working Solution based on my findings of the Working Group's review of the potential uh, for firearm legislative re reform <clears throat> as published in November 2014 last year. The idea of the working solution is to encourage synergies and to provide for a forum through which the coalition can support government and work towards a thinking solution which the government can then act. And I'm not sure if we're quite there, but the underlying, this is sort of looking forward then, the underlying message of the working solution recommends a review of the current firearm legislation regarding its application and licensing system by way of the adoption of a new comprehensive system that can be organized into two sectors. Okay, so you go one which is the practical side, Handled by the private sector through clubs, this deals with the applicant firearm choice, courses in proper management and uh, use, subsequent assessments and tests, and then finally accreditation, which has the potential for like firearm NCTs or DOEs. The length of the program should be important, as the potential time needs to be drawn out long enough so as to allow for information to be properly absorbed by applicants and uh, assimilated. This underlying firearm ownership as a privilege, as individuals that have to work hard to own firearms, but learn and appreciate in the processes of so doing. Now, on the other side, we've got the administrative side. Uh, this sees Gardi dealing with policing administrative aspects, such as psychological profiling and due diligence, due diligence of applicants, that is, uh, as well as the, the issue of firearm controls and licenses, which uh, Gardi already do very well. So if we look at the two sides a little in, in combination, 
The practical side promotes the sport, promotes industry growth within the private sector, promotes community growth within clubs um, by way of a self-policing, as the club environment promotes safety um, as a natural progression. This greatly reduces the likelihood for atrocity, as clubs would inform Gartie of any concerning uh, character traits or single mentality of an applicant, which Gartie may already be aware of being part of the same community in which the applicant lives. And on the other side, more specifically towards the Gartie, um, the, administra the administration side promotes Gardi, uh, sorry, promotes government at Gardi as uh, already uh, who already understand the uh, the community more practically, more practically the applicant uh, in question. <clears throat> the sorry, the app, sorry, and, and practically the applicant in question now don't have to worry. The Gardi don't have to worry about not understanding firearms, which I think is uh, is a pretty cool uh, way of looking at it. A pretty uh, interesting point. It also promotes a standardization by platform by review, which leads to the cessation and unnecessary court appearances of Gardi and the resultant cost to the state, which also needs to be a point of worth bringing up. You know? Now, both sides promote uh, safety and rid the process of this postcode discrimination. I can never remember the, the, the name here. Is it pro proficiency or proliferancy issue, whereby uh, two platforms are you know, licensed between various jurisdictions? But that would be standardized right out by a new system, okay? Now, the link between the two is the, is the Gardaí. That's in the new comprehensive system. Gardaí are empowered by the introduction of properly trained firearms officers who interact with and monitor the practical side and safety at a club level. So you'd have Gardaí basically having, being rep their represented interests being held by properly trained firearms officers or representatives, okay? The firearms officers would have the opportunity to be involved with firearm and magazine manufacturers with respect to the issue and of reduced magazine load maximums to Irish standards. Although in my document, I recommended 10 cartridge magazine loads maximums as the uh, new system promotes considerably safer shooting within a controlled environment and uh, hopefully a sort of a as a trickle down, uh, safer firearm storage mentality. So uh, less uh, result in firearm theft should happen by, by potential. <clears throat> the, um, the current emphasis on justification for firearm ownership needs to make way for a more progressive regime, which places more responsibility on the applicant in terms of performance, which in turn allows for the, the, availability, the availability of a variety of platforms uh, to be shot without the need to restrict calibers or to reduce magazine capabilities or, cap or capacities. <clears throat> um, if an applicant desires a firearm, so that's uh, a point, desire versus justification, then the, uh, the re then, the, then the time and cost associated in gaining accreditation prior to due, due diligence should be worthwhile. Not only that, but in having a better understanding of a firearm, its, uh, its, its storage, its capability, its maintenance, and its ownership, both the licensee and the firearm should be safer as a result. So the point here being basically there's a trend, you know, uh, justification, responsibility, desire, fun, sort of all heading in the right direction. Now, aside from an animal husbandry issue, um, there is no justification for civilians to own and shoot firearms in the Republic other than for sport and for fun. So, thus, a provision for the responsible ownership of firearms over and above that of limiting the choice of firearm available to the potentially irresponsible needs to be considered. And I have an example here which I've taken from the uh, review document um, with respect to firearm li licensing application. And it's something that reads, other, other rifles could be licensed for the same purpose as, say, the semi-automatic uh, uh, platform which is currently under review today. Um, but it also implies that other rifles or such other rifles could as well and, be, and easily be used for wrongdoing or for unlawful concern. So that's something that, you know, is probably worth a review because it places the responsibility on the, on the firearm as opposed to on the user as an individual. So, in summary, uh, the proposal of the working solution is the implementation of a new comprehensive system based upon years of gathered experience that educates firearm users to be responsible as opposed to the placing of limits on the equipment that uneducated firearms users can access. Um, I believe that this will actually uh, promote the sport and safety through the practical sector. At the same time, it's greatly reduced the risk and likelihood of crime, result, you know, less result of theft and then reduce the risk of as, as atrocity because you've got the practical administrative sectors working well together. Okay, thank you. Interesting, interesting, quite challenging, but quite interesting. Okay, we might, we'll tease that out a bit further with you later on. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Mr. Hannigan, you, you represent the Wild Deer Association of Ireland, I believe. Okay, sir, the floor is yours. Uh, Chairman, deputies, senators, uh, on behalf of our members, I would like to thank you for the invitation to brief the committee 
uh, on the issues and concerns the Wild Deer Association of Ireland has in relation to proposed amendments uh, to the current firearms licences system, which are contained in the recently published report by the Department of Justice and Angarda Shikana Working Group. Firstly, I'd like to wish to acknowledge the courtesy and assistance that the Association has received from the Committee uh, Secretary, notably Alan Guyton, in preparing for this session. Please let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Damien Hannigan. I am Secretary of the Wild Deer Association of Ireland. Uh, this organisation represents the interests of more than 4,500 deer stalkers throughout Ireland. Our members also partake in other licensed sports, which include competition target shooting and other activity affected by these proposed amendments. Our interest goes beyond one of sport. We assist with the training and certification of deer stalkers to educate in the skills of ethical deer management. The association also focuses on the conservation of Ireland's deer population and continues to work closely with Angarda Shikana and the National Parks and Wildlife Service in tackling Ireland's wildlife crime epidemic. We also work with other leading sports organisations such as Countryside Alliance Ireland to ensure these animals are protected for future generations. Chairman, as you and the members will be aware, there has been considerable controversy about the proposals contained in the Working Group report. This is because the report is not only flawed, but it is also highly offensive to Ireland's responsible sporting shooters. Several statements and comments have been made by the working group that suggest there is a relationship between the ownership of a legally held sporting firearm and criminal activity. The report cites public safety as the basis for the proposed changes. Whilst public safety is the fore of the association's objectives, we strongly disagree with this aspect of the report as there is no evidence to suggest or show any link between legally held sporting firearms and a risk to the safety of the general public. If we look to other examples of firearms legislation, we can receive guidance on what is effective for both responsible sporting shooters and public safety. Northern Ireland has some of the strictest gun licensing laws, but yet the use of handguns and the reloading of ammunition in a private residence are licensed, and without any negative consequences for public safety, or an increase in criminal activity. In fact, a recent report published by the PNSI shows a year-on-year -year decline in firearms and ammunition offences since 2003, and resulting in just four offences in 2014. We fully comprehend and agree that any firearms licensing policy must satisfy the suitability of an individual to hold a firearm licence in the interest of public safety. The Association and Ireland's responsible shooters see the current licensing system as completely sufficient in this regard. In fact, our current licensing system ranks as one of the most restrictive within the EU. As a responsible hunting organisation, we welcome any attempt to end the criminal misuse of firearms. However, again, we reiterate the fact that there is no relationship between the ownership of a legally held sporting firearm and criminal activity. If our organisation can provide any further information for the chairman and members of the committee, then please do not hesitate to ask. Thank you, Mr. Hannigan. I appreciate that very much. Uh, Mr. Kyo, um, you're from Harbour House Sports Club, I understand. That's correct, yes. I think the floor is yours. Thank Good morning. You. Um, and I'd like to thank the chairman and members of the committee uh, for affording us the opportunity as Harbour House Sports Club to address the committee on this issue. I'm Declan Kyo. I'm Chief Range Safety Officer and Chief Firearms Instructor at Harbour House, which is a sporting amenity that's based in Atai, County Kildare. We cater for sporting needs of the local community and a wider community of target shooting members and provide rifle and pistol facilities. Harbour House was formed in 2006. Our ranges have been inspected by the Department of Justice appointed range inspector and are approved for the purpose of target shooting with pistols and rifles. Harbour House has been authorised by the local Garda superintendent to operate as a target rifle and pistol club. The club is operated to the statutory requirements as dictated by the current firearms legislation. Conditions have been attached to the operation of the club and the range by the authorising letter from Angarda Shea and we've supplied copies to the, to the committee. I would contend that with such scrutiny and in compliance with strict regulation as laid down by the 2006 amendments to the Firearms Act, as well as the associated statutory instruments, that the committee might be of a mind that we are a highly regulated sport and the substan substantial trust of such regulation is in the interest of public safety. Harbour House has a membership of just over 300 members and we cater for male and female members as well as individuals with disability. Target shooting sports are one of those unique sports in which men and women, disabled and able-bodied individuals compete equally side by side. There are 188 pistols currently licensed to our members. 
Harbour House are passionate about the safe use of firearms. Since we opened, we have trained 72 members to an internationally recognised level of certified range safety officers. Target shooting in its various forms are participated every week. We cater for rifle and pistol shooting. Our membership are very safety conscious, having to undergo a mandatory safety course on the safe handling of firearms in the first month of membership. As a sporting community with more than 300 members, we provide a valuable contribution to the local and wider community. With the membership having 188 licensed pistols, the proposed changes to the legislation would have a devastating impact on our club. Volunteerism and community are fundamental values and that the club is run on. The membership of Harbour House would certainly drop below the critical level required to sustain the viability of the club and range. The livelihoods of our proprietors would be ruined. Men and women who have suffered the long years of austerity and while confronted in the knowledge that they can pursue their sport in peace will feel a deep disappointment in the government which they have supported, which now oversees the potential removal of their sporting pastime and with a view to avoiding any liability for compensation. Criminal activity would be unimpeded, unimpeded by such a move and would likely continue apace as was the experience in the UK when short firearms were banned in the late 90s. Look at our nearest neighbour, Northern Ireland. Note that in excess of 13,935 handguns are licensed to private citizens within the state of Northern Ireland, a fact that was not uh, included in the report from the uh, Garda Síochána and Justice. Northern Ireland have had several of reviews of legislation and not made any changes to the lawful ownership or access. And indeed, in 1988, in the aftermath of the awful tragedy in Dunblane, Mo Molan, with a full understanding of Lord Cullen's report, made the following statement to the House in the UK. After, such, after much thought, I am, persuaded of the need, I am not persuaded of the need to prohibit the possession and use of target handguns in Northern Ireland. And to this day, target handgun shooting is alive and well in Northern Ireland. Pistols have been licensed in this state since 2004, and we would like evidence of that that validates the intention of the recommendation of Angarda Siakana that our sport is a danger to public safety. Ten years of, of, of proven um, safety is, is behind us. Remove our sport for what reason the effect would be to, to benefit the economy and move the prosperity related to sports to Northern Ireland. A significant number of, of our members would move their, their sporting activity to Northern Ireland. In 2006, the amendments to the firearms legislation brought forward a raft of range standards for the development and operation of shooting ranges. The legislators at that time saw fit to provide for construction and pistol uh, for for, for construction and pistol range standards. The clear intention of the legislation was to facilitate rifle and pistol shooting and with the primary objective of ensuring public safety. It is not unreasonable to state that the investment in the range facilities at Harbour House has been in excess of €400,000 to comply with the legislation that was invoked in 2006. It is our contention that the review by Angarda Siakana and the Department of Justice makes a mockery of the construction standards the regulation and certification of the ranges of the appoint, uh, by the justice appointed range inspector, and in particularly the highly regulated conditions imposed by Garda Siakana on the operation of the club and ranges at Harbour House. The Firearms Amendment of 2006 recognised the legitimacy of shooting sport by use of pistols and was enacted by the Oireachtas. Harbour House, has, has, Harbour House have, in the history of the club, had not had any recorded breach of the firearms legislation by its members in the storage, transport or use of firearms for target shooting. Harbour House ranges have not been cited for any breach in the conditions laid down by local superintendent. Harbour House ranges are operated to the standard as dictated by the legislation force and we now find our support under attack from the Gardaí by speculation and scaremongering about the potential for a limited number of firearms and by the extension their owners to commit an atrocity. Not one shred of evidence has been recorded by the Gardaí in their review of any malpractice by Harbour House or indeed by any other authorised club in this state. Harbour House would urge the members of the Joint Committee to see through this report, having no substance, providing no evidence as to the real potential of such an atrocity perpetrated by lawfully licensed firearms holder, and to initiate an investigation into the maladministration of the firearms legislation by Angarda Siakana, which has resulted in 650 district court cases and now nearly 200 judicial review proceedings. It is the considered view of the members of Harbour House Sports Club that recommendations are nothing other than to legitimise the maladministration of the firearms legislation and to give unreasonable powers to Angarda Siakana with respect to the firearms licensing. The effect of such changes would be far-reaching and have no substantial evidence of their effect being offered by Angarda Siakana as part of the report. 
Minister Fitzgerald was quoted in Sunday Independent this week saying that she believes politics is the place where by the, your actions you can change people's lives for the better. It's our belief that this would not be a change for the better. With the Minister's thoughts in mind, I would urge the Committee to determine what evidence, if any, exists with respect to the misuse of firearms by Angarda Shia Khanna, uh, which they want to remove from civilian ownership, and what proof has been offered that such removal of any firearms would have any effect and consider how people's lives would be affected to the, to the worst. I'm happy to answer any questions that the Committee may, may uh, have regarding the submission, and I thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Keogh. Thanks for that. Mr. Symes, uh, you represent the National Target Shooting Association, I understand. Thank right, you. Sir. Five minutes. Thank you. I'd like to take the opportunity to thank the Chairman and the other members of the Committee for inviting a representative of the National Target Shooting Association here today. I'm Keelan Symes. I'm Director of the Association since 2006 and currently Treasurer. I've served as International Team Manager and I'm one of the Association's delegates to the Olympic Council of Ireland. I'm also a qualified ISSF judge and also an active participant in our sports up to and including national level. The NTSA is the sole national governing body for the rifle and pistol disciplines of the International Shooting Sports Federation. Seven of these ISSF disciplines are Olympic events. The NTSA is a member of the Olympic Council of Ireland, has recognised NGB for Olympic rifle and pistol events and is affiliated to the Federation of Irish Sports and the European Shooting Confederation. Our membership is drawn from affiliated clubs on the island of Ireland and our athletes compete nationally and internationally in ISSF World Cups, European and World Championships and have participated in previous Olympic Games and most recently in the London Paralympics. It is a somewhat surreal experience for a sporting body to be invited before a committee such as this in the context of legislation and in that case criminal legislation. Be that as it may, we fully understand that the equipment we use is not available as a right, but as a privilege bestowed by these houses and, by extension, the people of this state. In that context, we have engaged fully with the Firearms Consultative Panel, which was put in place by the late Minister Brian Lennon, and see our submission to this committee as a continuation of that process. I draw, I, to move on to the review that was carried out by the, uh, the Joint Committee, <coughs> the review was carried out for the following reasons. On Garda Shia had expressed concerns in relation to the continued licensing of certain firearms in the interest of public safety. Members of the judiciary had also cited lack of clarity and difficulty in inter interpretation of existing legislative provisions. Members of the judiciary had also raised the question of whether certain firearms should be banned given the concerns raised by <coughs> Garda Shia in the context of appeals of their decisions to refuse the licensings of such firearms. This issue of public safety is addressed in Firearms Act many times. An extension of the meaning of public safety beyond the consideration of an individual application seems unwieldy, and in the context of an act that concerns itself with such applications may well prove unworkable in practice. The quote by Judge Charlton in the Working Group report seems to indicate that it is also unnecessary. The act makes it clear that consideration of public safety, the good order of the community, and the proliferation of weapons within a particular district and within the community generally are all matters which can and should be taken into account. The issue of theft is a concern to us all. There are provisions in the current Firearms Act under SI 307 of 2009 that specify the minimum level of security required for every category of licensed firearm. If further security requirements are deemed necessary in order to safeguard the public, we would be happy to discuss these with the interested parties as we have previously done in the lead-up to the original SI being published. In our written submission to the Committee, we describe the basis of the Firearms Act as resting on the individual, good reason, and the licensing authority. It is our belief that the diverse nature of the licensing authority, coupled with the complexity of the laws written and amended, that is at the root of most of the issues concerned. One of the most striking omissions in the report was the, that of inconsistency in the application of the law with regard to firearms licensing. This has been a problem throughout the more recent history of the Firearms Act and is rooted in the fact that there are over 100 different licensing authorities in the state, between Garda districts and divisions. With even the best systems and training, it is almost impossible to find consistency with such a large and varied administrative base. This is further exacerbated by the normally occurring personnel changes through promotion, relocation or retirement. Add to this a legislative framework that runs to over 60 pages, including statutory instruments, and system failure is almost inevitable. We were proposing that licensing should be centralised. The benefits of this are that, one, consistency in application of the law in relation to firearms, the capacity to create a team of knowledgeable professionals capable of dealing with matters relating to civilian firearms ownership, as in the UK, these need to be not to be serving Gardaí. The freeing up of district and divisional resources for core activities. The creation of a permanent knowledge base within the team. 
a corresponding reduction in costs for every district in the state, a far more efficient system of administration, the ending of the persona designata anomaly, the almost certain reduction in court appeals that seem to have inconsistency at their kernel, and the capability of a centralised licensing authority to take <coughs> a more holistic view of the entire licensing landscape and influence policy directly. The argument made against this kind of system was alluded to in the report, that district officers would have a far greater knowledge of local matters and therefore be in a better position to adjudicate on applications than a central authority. This cannot be gainsaid. Clearly, district officers are indeed in a better place to adjudicate on applications. But this seems to rule out any possibility of communication between a centralised licensing authority and a local district officer. It is hard to understand how this can be such a strong case against centralisation as to outweigh the many positives outlined above. It is our belief that the current licensing system has many failings, but ease of access to firearms is not one of them. The current situation, which appears to be driven by a small number of court cases, could be paraphrased as hard cases make bad law. If a review of the Firearms Act seems necessary, then in our view it is necessary to modernise and simplify its operation first. If there is a recognised need to improve security, consultation with the relevant stakeholders would surely provide mutually agreeable solutions. We would respectfully suggest <coughs> reconstituting the Firearms Consultative Panel to discuss these proposals. Thank you, Chairman. A centralised system. One of the main suggestions you've made there. Uh, thank you, sir, for the work you put into that and for being here today. Um, Mr. Crofton, Mr. Desmond Crofton, is from is from NARC, uh, Sports Coalition. You're very welcome, sir. Thanks for being here. And thank the floor is yours. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, probably unlike my colleagues, uh, I, I work f as a full-time professional representing uh, shooting uh, sports for the past 24 years. Um, and uh, I work for the National Association of Regional Game Councils, which is the largest uh, shooting organization in the state. But uh, in relation to this particular matter before the committee, I'm also representing a number of uh, eight other additional uh, organizations. And on behalf of all of them and, and the, the various other supporting organizations, I, I do, like my colleagues, wish to thank the chairman and your, your colleagues for affording me the opportunity to address the committee. Uh, sports shooting in its various forms has always been popular in Ireland and it is today enjoyed by, passionately by tens of thousands of hunting and competitive target shooting enthusiasts. It is an honourable pastime which demands skill, discipline, commitment and a very high level of responsibility. Some people enjoy golf or cycling or canoeing with great passion and sports shooting people are no different except in one regard. Each and every one must pass a rigorous character vetting by the Gardaí, provide strict home security measures and meet a raft of other personal requirements in order to be allowed to participate in their sport. This is a singularly unique difference between sport shooting and other sports. But Irish firearms owners have been staunch supporters of our strict licensing regime, which is the toughest in Europe, as you've already heard from uh, one of my colleagues here. The current regime was agreed by all the stakeholders, both state and sporting, and was implemented in August 2009, so it's only five years old. It is therefore not an exaggeration to say that all who participate in shooting sports are among the most law-abiding in the state, having had to submit to vigorous vetting. It should therefore be no surprise to anyone that the current measures to place further restrictions on access to our sport without just cause has been received with alarm and anger by sport shooting enthusiasts. A joint working group comprising representatives of the Department of Justice and Garda Siakana have uh, re produced a report, the recommendations uh, of which purport to address a public safety issue based on an unsubstantiated allegation of a connection between lawful firearms ownership and criminal use of firearms <clears throat> and a further unsubstantiated allegation that members of the judiciary have expressed difficulty in interpreting the provisions of the Firearms Act. The data supplied to support the recommendations is variously false, selective, self-serving and biased. The facts of the matter are there is no credible evidence that such a link and therefore risk exists. The Sports Coalition submits <clears throat> no data has been provided to support the contentions and recommendations in the report and furthermore, we assert that no data which would substantiate the arguments made actually exists. On the contrary, we say, and we have submitted significant evidence to the committee in our submission, that there is no link between legal firearms ownership and criminal use of firearms. We say that all the international data and studies demonstrate that restrictions in legal ownership of firearms has never resulted in a reduction in either gun crime or risk to public safety. <clears throat> Impressing that argument, we have repeatedly called for an independent risk assessment 
and we believe this is warranted where the state proposes to ban our lawful activities and seize our property. That request has thus far been refused. We submit that where the state proposes to seize private property, and in this case without compensation, which we believe would in any event be ultimately held to be unlawful, the state has a very high duty of care to ensure that its proposed actions are justified and proportionate to the risk, the risk alleged. That bar has not been met in this case. The report and recommendations must be viewed against the background of serial breaches of the firearms legislation by the licensing authorities since 2009. Just want to, um, want to uh, ask you to not make that comment. We can't actually allow that here. As you, if you recall the original statement I made, yes. we can make allegations like that here. Okay. Um, it is no secret that this has resulted in over 650 court challenges by license holders to force compliance with the laws. And in 95% of those cases, the judiciary has agreed with the firearms owners. The current recommendations really do not have a link between lawful firearms ownership being linked to crime, but those seek to legitimize the acts uh, within the legislation which have been found by the courts to be unlawful, to legitimize them and, and to provide a legislative framework within which they can happen. To use the arguments which have been put forward to justify these recommendations are extremely offensive to a large section of Irish society and the members of which, I, as I have said, are foursquare law-abiding. Having suffered five years of inconvenience, cost, arbitrary decisions and disregard which, uh, for, for the provisions which govern our sports, this group of citizens, which I represent, Mr. Chairman, have really, I suppose, become exacerbated and, uh, and have been exhausted, and they've, they've really had enough. I can tell you that uh, currently there are yet another 40 courses sitting, uh, cases of challenges sitting in the High Court. Uh, and only yesterday, the Deputy Master of the Court remarked that uh, it was uh, rather unfair to the applicants, and the matter has now been referred to the, the uh, President of the High Court. Uh, we are willing and able and ready to work with the authorities if there is a problem to address that problem, but nobody has uh, approached us to work with us on that. And we trust as they find it, that the committee members will have due regard to the factual arguments and data and to our proposals as set out in our submission. And I'm quite happy to answer any questions or queries which your colleagues may have, Chairman. Thank, Thank you. you very much indeed. Um, now we'll open it to, to members of the committee. Uh, so now, Mr. Stafford, can I invite you to kick off, please? Thank you thank very you. much. I would like to thank the Chairman of the Committee for, for the invitation to speak today. I would also like to thank Committee members for listening to my submission. I started shooting at 17 when I joined the FCA and have continued my shooting, shooting in my personal time with various firearms over the last 15 years. Since getting my first shotgun and rifle at 19, I have owned a total of one non restricted rim fire rifle, two restricted centre fire pistols three restricted shotguns and seven restricted semi-automatic centre-fire rifles. I'm qualified as an armour having completed a four-year apprenticeship in 2007. Part of the responsibilities of my job include, but are not limited to, the inspection and maintenance of small arms. I have a vast knowledge in the workings of both civilian and military firearms to include pistols, shotguns, bolt-action rifles, assault rifles, light and heavy machine guns, mortars and grenade launchers. I'm also studying, currently studying mechanical science in Cork Institute of Technology. I have on several occasions given evidence in cases against the state where people had a pistol and or rifle license application refused by Angara Chikana. The reason for these refusals is due to Angara Chikana classifying such firearms as, pistol, as military pistols or assault rifles. I'm here to talk about and answer any questions of a technical nature in relation to these type of firearms and correct information presented to the committee here. While firearms legislation itself is fragmented and flawed, the problem is grossly compounded by the organisation left to run the licensing, firearms licensing system. My submission outlines, outlines how I believe on Garrity Khan and the Department of Justice have used legislation in a way not intended to by legislators to slowly remove legally licensed firearms from law-abiding citizens. I have in my submission addressed only a few issues stem from the Working Group's report to include guard statistics, the Iraq debate in 2009, background provision of centre-fire pistols, 
mass shootings, the Connolly Hospital Report, and licensing of firearms in all jurisdictions. My proposals are my personal opinion on how I believe we can start getting away from the mistrust and frustration built up over decades because of Angara Shikana. I ask that you listen with open mind and I thank you for your time. Okay. Um, Mr. Denny. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to thank the committee for their invitation to speak here today. It's good to see those being impacted upon directly by the proposed changes in the working group's review document are being afforded this opportunity. You've read my submission, which contains more detailed notes, and I'm happy to answer any questions on that. But I wanted to open by trying to explain what we want from the law, why we want it, and why you want it too. As I said in my submission, what I and many other shooters would wish to see in the Firearms Act is a clear and unambiguous set of rules regarding firearms licensing, which are readily readable by everyone and which are enforced equally in all Garda districts. In my submission, I've gone into some detail on some of the technical problems that at present prevent that being the case, uh, such as the layered nature of the Firearms Act and other acts that make up the body of firearms law in Ireland, and others will no doubt present other aspects of this problem, and I expect the national governing bodies will present the details of their respective sports. But there's a fundamental perspective to this problem which I suspect may not be obvious to those outside the shooting community and which would assist the committee in understanding our viewpoint. In our sport, everything is measurable. Uh, the size, the shape, the weight of our firearms, the calibre of rounds used, the weight and thickness and tailoring of the clothing used, um, the, our stores, where our shots land, how they were fired and so on. Our sports coaching is built on this fact, our rule books are built on this fact, um, and it permeates every single aspect of what we do and the culture that surrounds that. <coughs> We're in a sport that is unique for its brutal honesty. You aim the shotgun, rifle or pistol and you pull the trigger, and then either you hit the target or you don't, and you can't hide from it. Everyone sees what happens. You can't say that uh, you did well but the judge uh, gave you some sort of unbiased or a biased opinion. You can't say that you did well but your team let you down. Um, you, you, can't say that, you can't say the ref was blind. You can't say any, anything other than that your own skill was the reason for the good or bad outcome of that shot. It's a fundamental part of the attraction to the sport. It's why 20 years into the sport, every minute I spend in the range I enjoy as much as the first. It's, it's there, there is nothing like it that I've ever found in sport and very little I've ever found like it in life. And to answer some of the questions that were being asked in this room earlier, this is why we do this. This is the fundamental attraction for this sport. Um, it does have the side effect that we are used to clear objective rules which make judgments based on physical features or events that can be measured in the real world with instruments. And so the judgments are mathematical in their objectivity. For example, an ISAF air rifle must weigh 5.5 kilograms or less according to the rule book. At the start of a competition, my rifle is weighed. If the scales say 5.5, I can enter the competition. If they say 5.6, I cannot. The judge running equipment control does not have to make a subjective decision. He or she just reads the scale. The rule is clear and easy to read, and everyone can look at a single rule book and see what that rule is, and competitors can check that they pass that rule ahead of time using the same equipment the judge will use, and they can be confident they will pass on the day. In contrast to this, the Firearms Act is frustratingly complex to read, and there is no single rule book for everyone to look at, and the judgments it calls for are highly subjective, and how they are reached is opaque to the applicant. And the decisions which affect us vary from issuing officer to issuing officer, so what is allowed and what isn't under the Act is often a function of your address, with no way to tell ahead of time what that might be, and I'm not even touching on the problems of those parts of Irish firearms law that are plainly daft, although we can discuss that if you wish. Um, this may sound like a niche problem, which affects a small number of sports people in a minority sport, but it is not. It has an effect on the public in general. We've seen hundreds of district, high and Supreme Court cases over the last decade or so, many of which have as a fundamental cause a firearms act that is effectively unreadable to the average person. These cases not only represent enormous amounts of time and money and stress to shooters, the equivalent of building and equipping several badly needed national level shooting ranges, but they also represent thousands of Garda man hours and millions of euros of public money and obviously the court's time, um, which are badly needed elsewhere, not arguing in a court over fiddly points of badly written law with people who frankly would rather be on the range taking part in our sport. Myself, I've spent years involved in the legislative side of our sport and bluntly I regard that as time wasted and sporting opportunities lost. We had no choice but to be involved, even from the first days our sports were at risk of being crippled purely by oversight or misunderstanding in the drafting process. But there are far better uses in our sports for our resources. If we had clear, universal rules in the Act, that would be possible. 
The only way I know of to get to that happy scenario from where we are now is, as I recommended in my submission, to undertake a restatement of the Firearms Act. Once we have the Act written clearly in one place, we can consider correcting some of its more obvious anomalies. But until then, if we apply more patches to an already overpatched body of law, we will simply be confusing the, situ the situation even more than it currently is, and we will in all likelihood create more problems than we solve. If we go down that road, we'll be right back here again in a few years, with even more guard of manors and public money and sporting resources lost as a result. And in the meantime, the average voter is even more in the dark about what protections the law provides them, and given how the media portray problems like gun crime, this can be nothing but a source of fear. Good law should reassure people by showing that a potential risk is understood and a fair system exists to govern it. The Firearms Act at present fails woefully in this task because almost nobody really knows what's in it. I would urge the committee, therefore, to reject the review's proposals in their current form, to recommend that the Firearms Act be restated to give us a known baseline to work from, and that the changes whose necessity will by then have become clear and obvious to everyone be worked on by all the stakeholders together to produce a clear, readable, boringly consistent law which everyone understands and can follow. The first Firearms Act stood unamended for almost 40 years because it had those characteristics. So while it is a privilege to appear here today before the committee, I would hope its decision will be one that means we don't meet again until 2055. With all due respect. Thank you. Like, dislike us that much. Thank you very much. Um, the, um, the, the the issue of a consolidated piece of legislation I think is what you're talking about there. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, thanks for that, uh, Mr. McCann. Okay. Thank that. you. Thank you. I'd like to thank uh, you, Mr. Chairman, and the committee for giving me the time to take part uh, in this meeting and to to address the uh, members of the committee. My name is Jeff McCann, and in my opening statement, I would like to give you just a personal background into. Uh, my involvement in the sport of target shooting and uh, some of the issues we've seen in the proposed legislation that we're discussing. Um, I'm a type 1 diabetic and uh, I used to be a scout leader and undertook many outdoor pursuits, used to play rugby, uh, but due to diabetic complications I'm unable to take part in quite a few of these competitions now. As a challenge and really to get myself out of the house, quite a few years ago I took up clay pigeon shooting and moved on then into target shooting, what he called for the uh, yeah, camaraderie, getting getting out of the house and working uh, working with people. Uh, as of that, uh, that has moved on now. We call now the honorary treasurer of Monster Target Shooting Club, uh, Club. and uh, we're for not not for profit organisation. And as part of the role, I'm responsible for the organisation of our club training days and our competitions. Uh, we are associated with NASRPC, which Mr. Copes here to uh, recall to uh, represent today as well, and we. Uh, undergo a lot of large amount of safety training with all of our new members with uh, and that would cover things like handling of firearms storage when off the range traveling to and from the range and also uh, range operations and what they need to do while they're actually on the range we also run mandatory safety refresher courses for all members on an annual basis and safety is very much the the, uh, the most important thing that we uh, we support while on, on the range we're comprised of over 50 current members in the club and uh, we uh, shoot a variety of disciplines, bench rest rifle and pistol, WA1500 competitions, uh, we have local competitions internally within the club, we also are part of the Munster League, are involved in the national competitions and uh, I've also shot what we call uh, at national and some international competitions uh, with a uh, small bore pistol. Target shooting is the only sport that I'm aware of uh, that uh, those who are over 17 years of age uh, male or female, disabled or able-bodied, or of any nationality, can compete together on equal terms. In my time, Monster Shooting Club, we've seen, uh, we've supported disabled shooters. We call people in wheelchairs. Uh, we've had everybody right through from uh, novices, 14-year-olds with their father on a training license, learning how to fire a bolt action shotgun, right through to Irish cha champions, people who have supported the uh, uh, supported Ireland at international competitions. You know, and, and really, really got, uh, we also have uh, a number of. Uh, uh, club members are in their 80s and are still competing to this day, what he called successfully. You know, so I think the phrase we called, uh, you know, right through from the docker to the doctor within the uh, the organisation. You know, uh, very very strong community spirit, bringing these desperate members of, of society together purely with the love of a sport. I have what he called, you know, gone through some of the, you know, the look at some of the firearms uh, licensing in general and the discussion. You know, there's a, there has been a discussion around uh, the statistics used in the, the the discussion document at the moment. You know, and uh, I think we have to agree that you know gun crime is a worldwide issue. However, 
the ease of acquisition of illegally held firearms is usually via organised crime gangs and has nothing to do with the sporting community. Um, I know that uh, this was an example we got, and uh, I'm quoting uh, Mr. Niall Collins on this in the Limerick Leader a couple of weeks ago, is where a strategy focused on the policing that targeted known offenders has led to the murder rates within Limerick region dropping from six murders in 2008 down to no recorded murders in 2014, purely focusing on uh, uh, organised crime. You know, the report and recommendations, uh, the document that was provided, gave no statistics uh, pointing towards legally held firearms being lost or stolen, those from registered firearms dealers, from members of Angarda, from members of the Defence Forces, or from the civilian population. So it's very hard to work out, you know, you know with the, the numbers that are quoted, because what is actually relevant towards the sporting population. It also doesn't provide any evidence with any illegal acts that have been committed, with the one exception that be of the Corbley brothers, which it has been reported we call in the Herald that that was a, uh, a firearm that was actually stolen outside the jurisdiction and would never have been classified as a, a legally held firearm in, this, in the Republic of Ireland. I also believe the firearms recall is it's very much a civil matter, not a criminal matter. Uh, I've never received a, as much as a parking ticket in my life, what he called, and uh, you know, to be dealt with under criminal uh, criminal uh, legislation seems to be quite uh, unusual to me. And uh, looking at other European countries, and uh, such as Germany, uh, it's dealt with the Minister of Interior, what he called, not not the, uh, the the legal, the BKA, etc. Uh, I do believe what he called, however, what he called, is critical that Garda at all times would have a veto over a person on possessing uh, firearms certificates. However, it should be against the person, not against individual firearms, which is uh, the way it currently is at the moment. And uh, so, just moving on, really, what do you call it? I'd like to skip, uh, skip a little bit of what, he, what I have in here. Just go around to what do you call where, you know, my personal recommendations and the conclusion that I've, I've looked at from, a, you know, a recommended what do you call that would like to see the, uh, a meaningful uh, consolidation, what do you call of the legislation. Uh, I think it's a critical thing because it's very, very complex. We call it at the moment to try and work out anything is uh, disjointed. And also, I'd like to see what we call a progressive, logical uh, firearms policy uh, implemented in the country. I believe the firearms licensing is a civil matter and should be dealt with in a civil matter. And uh, firearms licensing is not a criminal issue, and therefore, we call it, I would, I would query what we call whether, whether it should be managed through justice and criminal legislation in the future. So there are a lot of examples, and I've listed some of them here in the licensing process. We call uh, places like uh, Germany, we call who have a very progressive and structured licensing uh, structure uh, that's dealt with by civil authorities. We call you maybe we can look at the best practices there, or maybe in Northern Ireland, you know, where I'm originally from, where there's over 15,000 short firearms held legally, you know, and uh, and managed there. So I'd like to thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and all the members of the committee for giving me a chance to address you on the matter today and hope I trust that you recommend we work together to find an amicable and safe method of continuing the sport of target shooting within the country. Thank you very much for that, Mr. McGill. Mr. Conroy. Uh, Lock, ladies and gentlemen of the Oireachtas Justice Committee, thank you for inviting gunshop.ie to attend this meeting and allowing us to present our submittal to your committee. Due to business travel arrangements made some time ago, Mr. Frank Brennan of gunshop.ie is unable to attend the committee on this date. Uh, he would, of course, be available to attend at any future meeting. Uh, in the meantime, my name is Brian Conroy. I'm a registered firearms dealer. I'm a family man, and I'm also a commissioned officer in the Irish Defence Forces with 16 years of service to the state. Some people might see a little irony in the fact that gunshop.ie have asked another firearms dealer to present their submission to the Oireachtas Justice Committee. Now, while it's true to say that as firearms dealers we would compete on a business footing, it should also be noted that as sportsmen who are engaged in a business established solely to support our chosen sport, we have a great deal of mutual respect. Hence, I'm present today to represent the position of gunshop.ie. Uh, we would firstly wish to express our disagreement with the Garda Shikana and Department of Justice and Equality Working Group report on the licensing of firearms. Uh, we feel that this report seeks to create fear where none should exist. It is entirely biased and was constructed with little or no input from groups with whom it would impact the most. Indeed, we are aware through our colleagues within the sporting groups that only a token gesture of consultation would be afforded to the sporting stakeholders and that this consultation would be disingenuous. Many very well respected sports people will be speaking to you during this working session and they will speak for our sport and elaborate on the social good which derives from it. 
Therefore, I will concentrate on the effects which the AGS DOJ report may have upon dealers in sporting firearms. Amendments made in 2009 saw a ban introduced on the licensing of centerfire handguns, and therefore no new entrants could participate in this sport. Even the sharing of a centerfire handgun on a licensed shooting range was then made illegal. There was, however, at that time, a concession made toward the sport of handgun shooting, uh, in that a sports person may apply to license a handgun which uses rimfire ammunition, which is, of course, of a smaller calibre. Uh, this concession was further underpinned at that time, uh, or shortly thereafter, by the publication of a Garda Commissioner guideline uh, on firearms licensing. And this, in this document, a list of small calibre handguns used worldwide in sports shooting was published. This list came to, no, to be known as Annex F. Since that date, this guideline document, um, which had become mantra in many Garda districts, um, with uh, on Garda Shikana license, licensing persons sticking very slavishly to that list, um, which in fact contained a number of firearms actually no longer in production. However, in late 2014, the Annex F list was withdrawn without any consultation whatsoever with the stakeholders in any section of sports shooting or indeed the business. Um, as a result, the stocks of gunshop.ie are now in limbo. Uh, gunshop.ie have purchased firearms which must be held with a wholesaler in Europe until such time as a domestic license is granted. These firearms have been bought and paid for and are now proving impossible to sell because of the move made by a government department, again, without any consultation with the stakeholders. The AGS DOJ report does seem to suggest that a pressure valve to uh, uh, release, uh, sorry, my apologies, a pressure release valve to the situation is to simply deflate the business of the firearms dealers and to have the stocks of heretofore legally licensable firearms sent to the north of Ireland. And I can assure the committee that having spoken with numerous firearms dealer, uh, dealers within Northern Ireland that this is a complete non-runner. Very strict quotas exist for those dealers in the north of Ireland and the pricing offered even for firearms in which there would be an interest would be only 10 to 15 percent of the market value of those firearms. We fear that any such immediate moves will result in certain categories of firearms dealers being asked to store firearms in numbers and thus creating a security risk. It should be noted that the AGS DOJ uh, report seems to regard the granting of firearms uh, licenses as a gift and something which could therefore be taken back. While sporting firearms license holders do certainly acknowledge that indeed it is a privilege to be considered competent to safely hold a firearm, they do not regard this privilege as any kind of gift. It is not given freely, as is the very definition of a gift. It is, in fact, typically hard won, having spent a number of months in the application process and a significant amount of money for the license itself and even more for the ancillary security upgrading which surrounds a license application. The AGS DOJ report document does give reference to the United Kingdom handgun ban and speaks of its success. It was not a success. In, and indeed, for 10 years post the ban on, on, on handguns there, gun crime did continue to rise. Only significant policing policy shift eventually saw those gun crime figures plateau. This document, we feel, is a wash with unsupported statistics of that nature. We note that the AGS DOJ document does not spell out the nature of any compensation scheme arrived at in the United Kingdom whereby sporting shooters were compensated financially not only for their firearms, but for the ancillary accessories purchased in support of their sport. A similar package would be the least that sporting shooters here would likely demand. As for the trade, the committee must note that the 200 plus firearms dealers nationally to be affected will likely seek uh, to pursue the defense of their livelihoods through the courts. Having invested heavily in order to meet the storage criteria and security standards set down by Angarda Shikana Department of Justice, uh, this report now proposes to remove the very mechanism by which, we could, we, by which we could recoup those investments. Some strategists say that the best defense is a good offense. We earnestly believe that this report is a good offense. It is a slight on sporting society and we feel it is made to deflect attention away from the poor administration of the firearms licensing duty of Angarda Shikana. We believe that the report is grounded in interpersonal differences arriving out of over 600 court challenges to the application of the legislation throughout Ireland. We would respectfully ask the committee to consider the setting aside of the report. 
We feel that the report, as presented, is not a balanced presentation of the facts, and we would ask that genuine engagement with the sporting and the trade interests be sought, and that such engagement would be incorporated into the formulation of future firearms licensing strategy. Thank you, Cahirlock. Thank you, Mr. Conroy, for that. Just to point out that the committee doesn't have the authority to set aside the report as such, we, would, we will be making uh, recommendations to the Minister based on the hearings today and the last day and further work we will be doing on this. But, but thank, thank you very much for, for your, your input. Minister Costello, please, five minutes. Thank you, sir. Thank you, uh, uh, deputies. And that I, my name is Joe Costello. I'm representing <coughs> the National Rifle uh, Association of Ireland. I'd like to thank the chairman and the members of the committee for the opportunity to address you. You will have read my submission, but rather than simply restate what it already contains, I would like to express some of my views on the whole concept of changes to the existing legislation. We already have some of the most restrictive firearms policy in the world. Uh, and as a member of the committee recently pointed out correctly, the root cause of most of the gun crime in Ireland is strongly related to the drugs problem. It is plainly obvious that those who illegally import dangerous and addictive drugs have no problem importing and using illegal firearms to commit crime, and that's a well-established fact. The drugs trade, the violence and disregard for human life as criminals carry out their vendettas is a matter for the Gardaí and the security forces of the state. Making the legislation even more restrictive has no effect on these people who have no regard for law and order, but it has a profoundly negative effect on law-abiding citizens who have already been vetted, vetted and approved by the Gardaí. As many will point out, there needs to be more clarity within the legislation and the removal of many subjective terms. We have concerns as shooters too that in whatever way the legislation is changed, that the Gardaí honour the letter and spirit of the law in its application, because sadly that hasn't been our experience in many cases. For example, um, as a colleague referred to, a list of permitted firearms was published in the Garda Commissioner's Guidelines. I was involved in that myself as a member of the FCP. Uh, this list, while not all-encompassing, was there by agreement between all the stakeholders involved, the Gardaí, the Department of Justice, the firearms dealers, and the representatives of the various shooting organizations. And yet, almost from its publication, these recommendations were lar largely ignored. And one of our concerns is that if we engage yet again in further agreement and discussion, we will, be tr will we be treated any better? Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay. Uh, stop. Very, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, first thing I'd like to point out is that I'm reading from an amended statement which has been placed on the record at this stage. Um, uh, I would like to thank the committee for the opportunity to express the views of the National Association of Sporting Rifle and Pistol Clubs, the NASRPC. Our organisation is the largest target shooting organisation in the country and represents the vast majority of rifle and pistol clubs engaged in target shooting. Our organisation is the national governing body for a range of non-Olympic target shooting sports in Ireland. Currently, our membership consists of 18 clubs with a combined membership of approximately uh, 2,500. The sportsmen and women whom we represent have achieved international success on many occasions, and Ireland is the gallery rifle world champions at the moment, having won the competition last year. Furthermore, Ireland will be hosting the gallery rifle world championship in 2017. From the outset, I would like to make it clear that the members of the clubs that we represent are Garda vetted law abiding citizens. Furthermore, they are sportsmen and women who seek only to participate in their chosen sport and develop it in a safe and sustainable manner. With this in mind, we sought to engage with Angarda Siakana and the Department of Justice over an extended period of time to bring about a mutually acceptable solution to the ongoing litigation which has been a feature of firearms licensing for the past number of years. Alas, despite our best endeavours, we failed to make progress. In the context of firearms licensing, we would point out to the committee that 650 cases, representing 92% of the cases taken, firearms were granted by the courts to sportsmen and women who were initially denied these certificates by Angarda Shekhan. 
We are not seeking the liberalization of the nation's guns laws, nor are we seeking a dramatic increase in the number of licenses issued. We are asking that the committee, we're asking the committee to recommend the firearms legislation implementation process be independently reviewed, ultimately to enable us to continue in our chosen sport and develop it in a safe and sustainable manner. The claim has been made that our sporting firearms owners are being targeted by criminals. Our firearms are licensed. There are 150,000 illegal and unlicensed firearms in the country. In addition, uh, in addition, given that firearms can be illegally imported with a customs detection rate of 10%, the evidence suggests that it is easier for criminals to import guns rather than to steal them. Is the theft of firearms from those involved in target sports a problem? No, it is not. The figure of stolen firearms, uh, sorry, I beg your pardon. The figure of stolen firearms for the past four years, 1,136, includes firearms stolen from dealers, blank firing firearms, crossbows, antique firearms, deactive firearms, humane killers, and of course, firearms stolen from members of the Defence Forces and of Ireland's If the proposal, If the proposal is to ban pit pistols, pump action shotguns, and semi automatic centre fire rifles because their theft poses a danger to public safety, the key figure must be how many of this type of firearm were stolen from licensed firearm holders. This is the key figure, and we urge Angarda Shikana to make this number available to the committee, as it is key to the discussions, and we believe it is likely to be low, in low single digits, if not zero. The proposal to allow issuing officers to refuse a licence on the basis of calibre, ammunition, velocity and apparent uh, appearance and lethality of the firearm is, in our view, not the way to proceed. We believe that the focus should be on the suitability of the individual applicant and not the firearm. We accept that all firearms pose an inherent risk if used illegally or incorrectly. We would like to suggest that the most effective way of preserving a sport where Ireland has achieved international success and is demonstrably safe is to initiate an independent review of all, acts or all aspects of firearms licensing and administration. Such a review should include all relevant stakeholders. As we have mentioned, we represent 2,500 sportsmen and women, but we are aware there are at least another 100,000 sportsmen and women who will be directly affected by this legislation. Finally, on a note related to natu natural justice, one can imagine a scenario where a superintendent, a new superintendent entering a district, could effectively wipe out a sport by deciding he or she didn't like the appearance of firearms used in that sport. The investment made by the shooting participants, clubs and ranges in that area would be lost without compensation. How is that fair, reasonable or constitutionally compliant? There is another reason we need, sorry, this is another reason we need an independent review of the firearms legislation. I urge the committee to, in, to initiate an independent assessment of the firearms legislation and its implementation. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Pro. Appreciate that very much. Very interesting. Um, could you tell us a little bit about the um, Gallery Rifle World Champions? Congrat congratulations to them for being world champions, by the way. When did that happen? Uh, that happened uh, late last year. We sent our team across to, um, to shoot in the World Championships. We were competing. In fact, one of the, one of the uh, successful team members is in the public gallery, so I have to, I have to be careful now. Um, the, the, the team had, had uh, following great practice in Ireland, uh, and I have to say success over the years, right? Um, they, they have been continuously improving. They uh, went uh, to compete uh, against the UK, Germany, South Africa, and uh, thankfully uh, they won uh, the competition, uh, repeating the success that they had um, uh, against the UK team in the um, NESRP International Open this summer in Harbour House Sports well, Club. Well done. Okay. Thank you very much for that. Um, congratulations to them. Uh, Deputy Kenny, you were first to